Hello, I'm Jaleesa Gephardt. I'm a service scientist here at SurveyMonkey, and I'm here with Rachel Thomas, who's the co-founder and president of LeanIn.org, and Hello. John Schoenstein, who is our chief sales officer here at SurveyMonkey. Yeah. And we are here today to talk about research that LeanIn and SurveyMonkey did and published this morning, which is about the experiences of men and women in the workplace, but really focusing on the aftermath of Me Too uh, over the last couple of years. So one of our, our, our main discoveries is that 60% of male managers are hesitant to have really normal workplace interactions with women. And this is up 14 percentage points from last year. So that's sort of our, the background that we're working it with. And right now we're going to have a conversation about some more detailed data points and what this really means for the workplace uh, moving forward. So uh, one thing I want to start with is that uh, some specifics about those types of interactions. So senior men said that they are 12 times more likely to hesitate to have a one on one meeting with a junior woman compared to a junior man, uh, nine times more likely to say that they would hesitate to have uh, travel for work with a junior woman compared to a junior man, and six times more likely to say they would be hesitant to have a work dinner with uh, a junior woman compared to a junior man. So I'm going to throw this to Rachel first and just ask, like, what do you make of this? What is the what does this mean for women in the workplace for the for companies as a whole? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, let's start by saying, and I know all of us are so supportive of the Me Too movement, and you know, we all agree that sexual harassment has to stop. Mm -hmm. I think the big message is that that's not enough. Yes. So let's level set a little bit. So women historically have gotten less mentorship, less sponsorship, less access to opportunities. In fact, I'll give you one data point from our Women in the Workplace research that we conduct with McKinsey and Company every year. 59% of black women have never, never had an interaction with a senior leader. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of level setting on we already have a problem. And then the other piece that I think is important for us all to internalize is that mentorship and sponsorship and access really matter. We know that employees with mentors are up to five times more likely to get promoted than employees who don't have them. So this data is absolutely a step in the wrong direction at a time when we need women to get more mentorship, more sponsorship, more access to opportunities. This means that women are likely going to end up getting less. And John, can you give us your perspective from a male manager yeah. perspective, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is this is this behavior is a huge problem. And I think it's also not just a big problem, but it's a huge missed opportunity. Um, when you think about uh, men avoiding interacting with women, younger women, especially whether it's through not not mentoring them or not working with them and not working, doing one on ones the way that 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 a good leader should. Um, it's it's a huge missed opportunity because it's obviously a problem for the female uh, kind of workforce within the organization, but it's also a big problem for those men who, uh, you know, whether it's perception and how they're perceived as a leader, it can also be a huge problem with their customer base. So if men are avoiding interacting with women and um, just not not working closely with them and not interacting the way that a good leader should, it gets out there, that perception sticks, and that can then uh, really taint the uh, the perception of that company with your customers. So okay. it's not just the impact that it has on the organization themselves, but also could have a big impact on customers. That's a great point. And um, I guess sort of like just to set the stage, so why, why are we mostly talking about um, men mentoring women and not like, why aren't women mentoring more women? So I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Everybody should be mentoring and sponsoring and looking for opportunities for everybody in our, our workplace, regardless of gender or your background. But I do think it's important to remember that two thirds of managers are men. Three quarters of leaders are men in organizations. And a lot of this is about power dynamics, right? A lot of sexual harassment is rooted in an imbalance of power in organizations. So that means that people who have the power, which are predominantly men right now, need to do better. And that means reaching back and lifting up women, spending time with women, mentoring women, sponsoring women, and all the things that we're talking about here today. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that clarification. Um, so to that point about sexual harassment, uh, the study really sort of quantified the experiences of women in the workplace. So 57% said that they've experienced some sort of sexual harassment in the workplace, whether that is being uh, physically harassed or hearing inappropriate comments that other people are making. Um, an interesting tidbit on this, too, is that men are twice as likely to say that harassment is decreasing compared to women. 
So my question to both of you is like, how, how can these people who are presumably working together um, have these different experiences and like seem to be living in these different realities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, we see this in a lot of the research we do that women and men see the world a little differently. And this is human nature, right? We see the world through our own lens. So it's not surprising mm -hmm. that women are a little bit more pessimistic about what's happening in regards to sexual harassment and men may be a little bit more optimistic. As I said, I think that's a trend we generally see when you look at the workplace. In some cases, you really do see a his and her workplace. But I think that's why having these discussions yeah. really matters yeah. so that we can have empathy for each other's experiences we can better understand each other's experiences so you know that's why what yeah. we're doing here matters i love that. that that's so 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 true and i would say i think there's also just this like having the conversation and making sure that there's good awareness about what's happening and so when i think about my team one of the things that we focus a lot on is training and so we make sure that sexual harassment training is up to date and everybody has, has completed that. And that goes for not only men, but for women, everybody, course, yeah. right? Kind mm -hmm. of equally across the entire workforce. Um, there's also kind of this aspect of not just sexual harassment, that's kind of the overt version of that, but but also you've got microaggressions that can mm -hmm. also really be damaging for, for a company culture and within a team and uh, you know, obviously make people feel very uncomfortable. And so we do a lot of, we put a lot of focus on uh, training around unconscious bias and just driving that awareness that maybe some men, part, maybe part of the answer to this question is maybe they just aren't aware of how their, how their actions and what they're saying uh, is impacting uh, women or other people. It could be also impacting men adversely on the team. Mm -hmm. There, I, I just think that that needs to be brought up, discussed, um, and there needs to be training around it. And then the other piece that has landed really well with my team in trying to help fix this problem is really talking through specific examples and making sure that men are brought into the conversation. And it's clear that this conversation that you had and the way that you showed up in this meeting actually wasn't right. And here's why it wasn't right. And that sort of clarification uh, seems to be helping. So you brought it up, so I'm going to put a little plug in. So we just um, released a program called 50 Ways to Fight Bias. Mm -hmm. um, and it is exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. though. Very specific mm -hmm. examples mm -hmm. of bias in the workplace, yeah. what it looks like, a woman being spoken over, mm -hmm. a comment being made, you know, assuming a woman of color is more junior than mm -hmm. she is, but very specific so people understand what it looks like, yeah. and then very specific recommendations on what to say, yeah. um, and a research-based explanation for why it's happening. So I agree yeah, wholeheartedly, getting into the details and kind yeah. of breaking this apart into pieces and not talking about it generally is yeah. critically important. Yeah. Great. And sort of related to your point about microaggressions and your point about like, you gave a couple of examples of um, things that really are microaggressions. So being excluded uh, based on your identity is like definitely a microaggression. Mm -hmm. And we just did some research um, about the experiences of microaggressions in the workplace. And we found that um, to your point about conversations, the most people who have experienced microaggression would prefer that uh, what they really want to happen to the person who you know said something inappropriate to them is they want their, 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 that person's manager to talk to them, they want HR to talk to them, they don't want them to be fired. Mm. Um, it's really like, you know, this, this just often comes from a place of ignorance, not malice. Um, so, you know, sort of thinking about this as a as sort of a microaggression and just like giving yourself a little space to, to uh, not blame yourself necessarily, but say like, I can do better than this. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, we, I guess we can, we can turn to what companies, so both of you brought this up, like what companies and what individuals can do. Um, and 70% of people say that their company has taken action in the last two years. Um, and 71% think that changes, those changes have actually made harassment less likely in their workplace. Mm -hmm. So you guys spoken a little bit about what companies can do and what you guys are doing respectively, but um, can you go a little bit more detailed into that and how you can create a workplace that allows people to have these conversations and promotes mentorship. Yeah, so I think, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but companies certainly need to be committed to really quick, thorough, fair investigations mm -hmm. of any claims yeah. of sexual harassment. So all employees believe that they'll be seriously addressed yeah. and quickly addressed and fairly addressed. Um, I think we talked about this a little bit too, these, these difficult conversations where we're talking about stuff that does feel a little uncomfortable, I think that's incredibly critical as well. And then just circling back um, to what I think men can do related to 
the inclination to pull away from women a little bit. Um, so I strongly believe that we all know what respectful behavior is. <laughs> like we know where the line yeah. is. Um, you know, you don't hug your mother the same way you hug your girlfriend right. and, and you all get that. Um, we, everybody here gets it. Um, but that said, if men do feel a little uncomfortable spending time one-on-one -on -one with women, I just don't want them to use that as an excuse to pull back and not mentor and not sponsor and not to create equal access. And there's a couple really practical things. So if you don't want to have dinner with women, don't have dinner with the men on your team. Mm -hmm. Lunch is for everybody. And if you're afraid to meet one-on-one, -on -one, and again, I hope that men can get over this as we have these conversations, but if you are feeling some hesitancy, you know, meet one-on-one -on -one with a woman and leave the door open. Mm -hmm. So the big thing for me is don't use that as an excuse not to yeah. do the right thing. Yeah. I really like that. Um, yeah. I read I read something along those lines in uh, Sheryl Sandberg's op-ed this morning that like if if what you really feel, like if you do some soul searching and recognize that you're really only comfortable having uh, you know breakfast meeting in the cafeteria with a woman like that's that's how you have meetings now right yeah so just right. like what are you really comfortable with yeah it's great and I love the like doing it with your entire team like if that's what you're going to do you do it with both the men and the women on your mm -hmm. team and it just becomes the new way that you're doing those, yeah, having those I think interactions that's right. yeah it's great I think uh, for me as I think about this and, and what we can do and what companies can do better um, I think for me it starts at the top too you've got to really demonstrate this as a leader and the entire leadership team has to kind of take this on as as a as a priority for the organization um, the the more junior level folks, men and women, are watching what leaders are doing and they're watching how they behave and what they allow to have happen and what they what they take action on and those sort of things. And so I think it, it really does start at the top. Um, I had a very interesting experience uh, just a couple months ago. So one of the things that we do here at SurveyMonkey is we run these, these events called Curiosity Chats. And these are internal conversations that um, <laughs> some of the leadership idea. team, right, exactly. Some of the different uh, leadership team members uh, lead these. And I, I had one with about 12 uh, employees here across the company. So not just within my organization, but across the entire company. And the topic that I had was self-advocacy. And at first I thought it was gonna be one of those things where I'm having to share whatever I've learned and, and that it might be a bit one way loaded, but what we tried to do in that event was to really make it interactive so that people could talk openly. And um, it was great to see over the period of three different meetings, the, the women in particular in the room really advocating for themselves and, and being uh, showing up strong and, and really uh, participating very actively in that. And so I think what that does is it opens up the conversation. And so I think companies can do a better job of, of creating space for those kind of conversations. And then the third thing I'd say is mentorship. I think mentorship is a huge part of what we're talking about here. Um, I think some men probably feel in particular that that being a mentor or having uh, having mentees at, or or getting a mentor, whether you're a junior woman or a man, doesn't matter, that, that it has to be this big formal process that that this requires a, a ton yeah. of time. It doesn't, right? It doesn't. It doesn't have to start that way, at least. Mm -hmm. And I've got three mentors that I've worked with for for a number of years, and uh, that's been extremely helpful in my life, um, both men and women. And um, I've also got mentees. I've got three mentees that I work with right now. The structure that I try to provide is pretty simple, and it's a rotating thing. So I've got three mm -hmm. at all times, but I've got about 12 different folks that I mentor throughout the year. And it's a sign-up sheet, and anybody can yeah. sign up for it. And uh, it basically comes down to three cups of coffee. So what that really means is it's three sort of 15 to 30-minute sessions, and it doesn't have to necessarily be these hours and hours of time that the mentee is dedicating to prepping for that, and then the mentor is uh, you know, having to do all kinds of analysis and, and, and provide a, a very you know, analytical um, reaction to, or, or kind of interaction with that, with that mentee, it can be a little bit lighter. And I think when you, when you frame it that way, it becomes a lot easier. Like, I don't know anybody in, this, in the leadership team at SurveyMuggy who would say, no, I'm not gonna do three cups of coffee yeah. with that person. It's a pretty lightweight way to start it and uh, can often lead to really, really good conversations. I think that's a great point. The other thing that, you know, also is, um, you talked about senior leadership and kind of how you talk to organizations. I think it's really helpful, um, first of all, to articulate the problem. Mm -hmm. If people don't know that women are underrepresented mm -hmm. in, in, in management and leadership in your organization, if that's not explicitly clear to them, it's hard for them to be part of the problem. I mean, part of the solution right. if they don't understand the problem. And then the other thing is, 
you know, I wish we could get everybody through the heart on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think many people we do, but there's also, you know, communicating the business value of this or kind of the practical values of this. So we know in organizations that have more women, um, sexual harassment is less Mm -hmm. prevalent. That matters. That's why getting women into leadership and getting more women into your organization matters. And then we also know in organizations where we have more women um, as senior leaders, not only do they outperform their peers from a business perspective, they tend to have more employee friendly um, benefits mm-hmm. and so in a more employee friendly culture. Right. So also that that all shits rise message, um, I think I is really it. important when we talk about why this stuff matters. That's so great. And just to kind of build on that, I think all of that completely agree. And I think there's also just so much value in having that diversity of thought in your, Absolutely. In your conversation. Absolutely. So with my leadership team, we've really um, you know, made it a priority to make sure that it's a very balanced uh, leadership team um, in all ways, right? So uh, we want to make sure both on the gender side and, and all ways that it can be as diverse as possible because I've found through my career that those types of teams tend to be much higher performing. Yep. And so it's great that for all the reasons okay. you said. Well, and we're the research yeah. support, yeah. so right. we'll tell yeah. you that exactly. research yeah. shows that diverse teams are happier Absolutely. and they tend to outperform teams that are less diverse. I mm-hmm. completely yeah. agree, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I think to your point about, you know, this doesn't necessarily hit through the heart for everybody, but there are other reasons that it's beneficial to spend time um, learning from both men and women. Uh, Xander Lurie, our CEO, published, um, uh, I guess, a, an article on LinkedIn today where he talked about um, some, some women that he's mentoring yeah. and that he, I mean, he learns a lot from his mentors, mm-hmm. from his mentees, right? Yeah. And if you are a senior man and you're only ment- mentoring men, you're getting great at learning what junior men think about yeah. the world and learning from them, but you're missing 50% of the population there. So there's totally. another reason to mentor women. If, so if, if Xander and Cheryl are lockstep on that point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She always says, if you want to be a really effective manager, that means you have to manage everybody effectively yeah. and get everybody's best ideas. Yeah, so I think that's such a good point. That's yeah, right. I think mean, yeah. that's such a good point. That's right. Love it. Um, so I think that's all the data points we can talk about. Uh, any last thoughts? Any more advice for people? You guys gave great advice so far, Um, specific advice, but any parting thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think um, I would just say, I think both men and women uh, do their best work when they feel like they've been heard and that they're valued. And it's so important to change this, what we what we have seen come up in the results of the survey. We've got to make sure that that men are are comfortable working with with junior women and to try to break those barriers down. Um, again, I don't think it has to be, I think we, we have kind of seen the, the pendulum swing fairly far on this. And I think it's just about bringing it back to the middle. It doesn't have to be um, a huge overcorrection to to get it back to where it needs to be. So um, I, I think part of it is like, get over it. And the <laughs> other part is there is huge, tremendous value that you unlock when you get a very diverse uh, group of thinkers together. So. And I would just say, you know, I think the Me Too movement is fundamentally Mm -hmm. about a safe workplace, but also an equal workplace. Mm -hmm. You know, we do need to change the power dynamics to ultimately make um, the workplace safer for all of us. Um, And so I hope all the men listening, and there's so many good guys listening who want to be on the right side of this, um, start to really internalize when you shy away from women, the impact it may be happening in your everyday um, work relationships and also at a macro level on what's happening in your organization and the representation of women. Absolutely. It's yeah. been great, guys. Great. Uh, not guys, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to incorporate yes, y'all more yes. into my language. Right. Underneath the language. Yeah, great. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, you can learn more about this at leanin.org slash mentor her and surveymonkey.com slash curiosity. <laughs> Um, this has been published all over the place, so read up on it. There's more data to be found. Um, thank you for coming. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.